sort of had a debate with myself about what to talk about here in a short time, but I've been in one city, Tacoma, for 30 years now, and I thought that the changes we have seen in our community might be of interest as we understand sort of how the various um, practices and communities go around the state of Washington. Some of our other presentations have included this kind of information from Spokane and Tri-Cities and uh, Yakima. So um, let's see. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So Tacoma as it stands today um, is, uh, well, we have about a million people in Pierce County, about 400,000 here in the city. There are two hospital systems here that are sort of dominant. That's the Franciscans and Multicare, which is who I've been working for for the last 15 years. Um, the Franciscans, when I moved here 30 years ago, included St. Joseph's and St. Clair Hospital, which is down in Lakewood, and Multicare had Tacoma General, Alan Moore, and then the Children's Hospital, Mary Bridge. In those 30 years, as you can see from the slide, there have been some new hospitals built, one over in Gig Harbor, one out in Enumclaw, a psych hospital here in Tacoma. And also during that time, Multicare has expanded its footprint by um, um, uh, sort of uh, forming a partnership with the hospital in Puyallup, Good Sam, and then with uh, um, Auburn General Hospital, and now over in Eastern Washington too. So the sort of um, uh, uh, densification or increasing the size of medical industry has been really quite remarkable. Um, Kaiser was here when I started, but didn't have a hospital and they did all their patient care at the other hospitals. And I'm not gonna talk much about Madigan or the VA or those kinds of things. I really don't have much insight into that. Next slide. So when I started in 1990, this is the list of people. There were two employed orthopedic surgeons here, both by group health. There were 11 groups. There were onesies and twosies and foursies and one, six and five, but that was the way practice was done back in that time frame. Um, you'll see as we go through this that that's changed a, a ton. Um, so next slide. So in the 19, in 1990, when I came, almost all physicians were self-employed. I mean, there were many small groups. Um, all of the orthopedic surgeons had privileges at all the hospitals. I remember the days of running around to three hospitals to make rounds in the morning, which was a pain in the neck. Um, no one had heard of electronic medical records in 1990, although everybody was using billing software to do most of your billing. The major payer was Pierce County Medical, which was later absorbed into Regents or Primera. And interestingly, we had a very active local orthopedic society with monthly meetings everybody would go to. That's all in the past now, too. Another interesting thing to know about the decade of the 90s is that there were at least three groups in this community that experienced significant fraudulent behavior by their employee staff. Um, two of them lost a, a large amount of money over a period of years. Um, so that just an interesting little tidbit, I guess. Um, next slide. So we get to 1995 and one group has merged with another and there's a little bit of consolidation, but pretty much the, the way of the land hadn't shifted all that much. Next slide. By 2000, um, we we're seeing some different things happen. Um, again, um, one of the groups had split up. Um, there was a couple of more solo practice. Interestingly, 2000, one of those solo practices was me. Um, but again, not a lot has changed, but next slide. The decade of the 2000s was really where things started to go crazy. Um, those who haven't been around or have been around will remember that we were getting increasing pressure from society, from government, both local and state and federal, um, and by the insurance plans to try to control costs. Remember then right around 2000s when we had the dot-com bust too with a big dump in the market. Um, early adopters of electronic medical records um, began in that decade of the 2000s. So, for example, here at Multicare, we um, got into Epic in about 2002. Um, small groups, like what I was at that point, uh, were looking at the writing on the wall and figuring that, you know, you, you have to go with an EMR, yet it's exceedingly expensive. And God help you if you make the wrong choice in EMR and have to do it twice. And also remember that in the 2000s, a lot of the business industry advisors for our hospital systems were telling the hospitals that they needed to employ their medical groups. And in Tacoma, that's exactly what happened. In the early 2000s, both the Franciscans and Multicare bought into having large, mainly primary care medical groups at the beginning. And sometimes that didn't work very well. The Franciscan medical group didn't last through the decade. Um, next slide. So I've slipped not five more years, but eight this time, because starting in about 2002 is when the employed models start to really go crazy in Tacoma. And between about 2003 and 2008, you can see the majority of orthopedic surgeons in this community became employed by the two healthcare systems. 
um, group health had grown a little bit and there were some still some private practices out there. Note the Lakewood group, that's what is now um, part of ProLiance here in the county um, at, at this point in time. And watch that group over the next few slides because there was some um, back and forth with that. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So 2008 was also the year that the ACA passed Congress and was signed by President Obama. Um, just briefly, most of us will remember this, but it broadly expanded coverage for lower income people, but at very poor reimbursement rates for providers. Um, most of the people that signed up um, through the, um, the health plan finder here in Washington, actually the majority were people who are al already eligible for Medicaid, less so than were actually um, treated under the Obamacare plans. Um, remember that there was a mandatory purchase of uh, health insurance, which was subsequently overturned um, by the next administration. Um, there were huge financial incentives for EMR, remember uh, meaningful use. Um, and essentially at, during that time between 2008 and the time of the full Im implementation of um, ACA, you pretty much had to have an EMR if you were gonna be a healthcare system. Um, it also led in the next decade to a lot of performance measures, which we'll talk about too. To me, the bottom line about the ACA is that put the final nail in the coffin of being a small onesie twosie private practicing group. That model, at least in a big community like mine, just isn't viable anymore, I don't think. And so um, that's why you see, I think people splitting off into either very large groups of, in private practice or seek the employed model. Okay, next slide. Um, in 2010, you'll note that there are 29 employed orthopedic surgeons in Tacoma, and um, what's the math here? Um, 11 now in private practice still. Um, interestingly, one of the groups, one of the largest orthopedic group that had accepted employment with one of the hospital systems was at this point in time, very frustrated. Um, they had done a three-year contract. They were negotiating for a better arrangement. The, the uh, hospital wasn't working with them. and Eventually, and you'll see in the next slide, that group then went back into private practice, merged with the group in Lakewood, and that's our large ProLiance team here in the west part of our county um, today. Go ahead, next slide. Oh yeah, so in the decade of the of the tens or whatever between 2000, uh, 2010 and 2020, um, we saw on the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we saw increasing pressures. Um, the whole talk about volume to value, about bundled payments. Remember that we got rid of what was called the SGR, um, the sustained growth rate formula through Congress, but then ended up paying for that with MACRA and MIPS, which is the merit-based incentive payment system, which I think most of us are operating under now. Certainly our hospitals are. Also um, during that decade is when um, the legislature in Washington started the Bree Collaborative, Collaborative and the Health Technology Authority to look at coverage decisions um, for uh, people who are covered by state plans. There also became an increasing need for us physicians to start to go fight the good fight administratively and um, um, legislative to try to make sure we didn't get buried here. And it was during that decade that the AAOS started its political action committee, which I hope everybody here is supporting. If not, you should be. And also during that decade is when surgery centers and specialty hospitals became a part of the conversation, again, offering a different way of service and largely offering a way for physicians to take advantage of some of the, um, the reimbursement that hospitals were getting for the facilities that, facility fees that they were charging. Okay, one more slide. So here you see that the number of employed physicians by Franciscans went way down and the Lakewood group grew hugely. That's because one big group didn't complete a contract with them and went back into private practice. And this is pretty much where we stand now and as well as in 2015 with um, the majority orthopedic surgeons in Tacoma employed, but, but not all. Um, okay, next slide. So here we are in 2020 with essentially nobody in small private practice. You've got the Lakewood ProLiance Group, which is doing quite well in private practice. And you've got the two major carriers or the two major hospital systems that are employing the rest of us in this community. Um, also, we've grown from something like 26 orthopedic surgeons to 42 during that um, 30 year period. Um, and one more slide. So one might ask, where are we going now? And my crystal ball doesn't work all that well. Um, 
I know that um, CMS, Center for Medicare Services, is pushing for the majority of Medicare reimbursement to be done on a per episode of care basis. In other words, if someone gets admitted to the hospital for pneumonia going forward, the hospital is going to get paid X number of dollars. And that's that. Um, there won't be, you know, on a per day or how long the patient stays basis. Um, in our world, um, we're seeing a lot of pressure to do bundled uh, care, particularly for common procedures like joint replacements. Um, in the future, it's likely that hospitals and us will be accepting considerably more risk. And a big question that I think um, is critical to orthopedists is who's going to control the bundle? In other words, are you as a practicing physician going to accept the bundle for doing total hips and then pay the hospital or pay your surgery center or whatever? Or are we going to let the hospitals control the bundle, which might not be the best thing for, for our future? Um, I just one other thought that I'd like to throw out there is that, you know, right now, um, if you look at the statistics by the AAOS, if you add up all the people that are in a large um, multi-specialty group, kind of like the way Permanente Medical Group works with Kaiser or are working for a large hospital system like me versus those who are in private practice, over half of us are actually employed in one way, shape or form these days. The thing is that I think, um, so you may ask, you know, why do I care about private practice and where I, I care a lot because I think that if private practice as a model dies and the hospitals employ us all, then we got no place to go. And so I really think it's important that we kind of continue to support that aspect of our practice so that we're not entirely drowned. <laughs> um, I have to run through that really quickly, but that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, it's not a lot about Tacoma. So, well, it's a lot about Tacoma, but it's a lot about sort of the pressures that have changed the way we do what we do over the last 30 years. Superb insight. Thank you, Nick. And sorry, we're on such a tight timeline. We're about, again, four great speakers and you let us off fantastically. Last month, uh, Chris Contogian has brought up a very important point that is having consistency of an orthopedic workforce in one community adds to a quality of care because of the familiarity and accountability. Have you seen an adverse influence of employed versus non-employed physician, or in other words, has been a greater burnout or transition in the workforce from the employed uh, segment of the surgeons where there's a greater chance for employers to kind of fill in widget positions? So not so much in the orthopedic community. Realize that even to this day, most of the orthopedic surgeons that became employed in Tacoma already had a history established in our, in our city. Um, there's not been a wholesale, um, you know, people coming in and working for a year or two and then leaving. Um, most people come in and stick around. Um, outside of orthopedics, though, you do see things happen. Um, you do see hospitals making decisions about service lines and things like that. Um, that are, uh, they, they feel threatening because, you know, Multicare could let me go with 90 days notice tomorrow and I wouldn't have anything to say about it. Um, um, I'd like to think that, that they wouldn't do that, but, but they have done that recently with um, one large group of inpatient hospitalists, for example. Um, I can't much speak to, to the place down the street. I haven't worked down there in a couple of years. Um, I know that um, they have had some churn over there in terms of people coming and going, but um, that's why I don't, I don't know beyond that. I don't know. I think, I think being employed has its advantages. I mean, I don't have to worry about who's paying my overhead every day and, 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 and that kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, trying to get things done, trying to keep the practice rolling, trying to make changes is sometimes painfully slow. So that's, that's kind of the, the trade-off. Hospitals enjoy, um, you know, a huge economic advantage over private practice because of the facility fees that we talked about. Um, and on the other hand, you could argue that, you know, a hospital also has to have a 24-7 ER that's available to treat heart attacks and strokes, which, you know, in, in your practice, you don't have to do that. So um, there's pros and cons to each of those um, things. Great. Must run on. Great insights. You're a treasure. And again, I hope that Multicare would never do that, but know that all <laughs> of us love you dearly and would protest and uh, try to get you into our various groups and practices. Uh, you're that much of a resource for all of our patients and our community. So thanks for all you've done and thank you for this great introduction. Thank you. Again. I feel secure in my job these days. <laughs> Good.